This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everybody to this week's episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. This is a monster episode, massive go home shows, two monstrous pay per views this weekend. We've got it all covered here, as well as WWE having a change of heart, some heat on these top guys in AEW, as well as the possibility of a retired belt in this company and a big name star who's a big man possibly coming back to this company, as well as somebody leaving. Another company. We've got all of that in store for you on this week's edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. Doing it with me as always. He's the one. He's the only. He is the Doc John Macroon. Cuz, are you ready for a jam-packed wrestling weekend? We've got pay-per-views galore. We've got shows we've got to run down and make predictions on. We've got things that have taken place in the wrestling universe. There's a podcast out there with one of the biggest names in wrestling history that we've got to talk about. There is stuff going on everywhere and we're going to tackle it all right here right now what's going on my man it's great among the many many things i'm doing i always make time for this podcast i get excited i saw the rundown i saw everything going on even after a crazy wild friday still make time to sit down and enjoy wrestling content it's great it's in my veins i'm excited because of the fact it's a big show and i didn't tie into the fact that the card of pay-per-view is really an homage to the 1992 SummerSlam. It really is something that has really taken over Europe and it is really spectacular, especially with Sheamus and Drew McIntyre being featured. I'm excited. AEW's got a lot of good things going on as well. It's going to be a massive, massive podcast. And the direction of WWE has gone in such a way that you are now invested in a lot of the matches and you're very, very excited to see what's going to happen this week. So I'm excited. I'm, you know, it's Saturday morning, uh, just, Now the sun's out, Labor Day weekend, and there's going to be some time spent watching wrestling for sure. And, of course, throwing back some cocktails. Yeah, for sure, many cocktails because it's going to be a ton of wrestling. It's a holiday weekend. It's going to be a a great weekend. And I thought we got some great wrestling. I thought what we got on Monday night and what we got on Friday night from WWE with Monday Night Raw and Friday Night SmackDown was some more good storytelling, more stuff getting you interested for what's taking place this Saturday and this Sunday at Cardiff, uh, there's a there's a ton going on. So again, like I said, more great storytelling with the bloodline. I, this has been one of those stories that have been incredibly interesting and has really pulled us in. The addition of Sami Zayn has been a nice little caveat. This to me kind of feels like they're going back to to that master manipulator that Roman Reigns' character is. He used to do it to to Jay Uso. He's now doing it to Sami Zayn. You look at the match that Sami Zayn ends up having, or that Jey Uso ends up having with Kevin Owens, and you work in this this story arc with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn from their history, which I thought was a really nice touch. It added an extra layer to this. You have Kevin Owens basically telling Sami Zayn, like, you're better than this. What are you doing? And in the middle of the match, the the bloodline, the Usos, are counting on Sami Zayn to hit Kevin Owens with a chair. Kevin Owens can't pull the trigger. You fast forward to Friday, Sami Zayn is now the guy in charge of putting together this bash for Roman Reigns to celebrate his two years as champion. And what ends up happening? You have Drew McIntyre basically disrupt the entire thing. Jey Uso still has some some hurt feelings with uh, Sami Zayn. I thought this was just more good storytelling. Adds another layer to what has been a really, really good story. I think we're all waiting for the Sami Zayn phase turn, and I, I absolutely loved it. I think this... Helps get you interested. I'm going to be honest with you. Going into this pay-per-view, I didn't think there was a chance in hell that Drew McIntyre was winning this. I know he's going to be in Cardiff. I know uh, he's basically the hometown boy. He's the hometown hero coming back. I didn't think he had a shot in hell of beating Roman Reigns. After this week, I'm feeling a little bit more inclined that you might have Drew McIntyre win this championship off of Roman Reigns. What did you think about this additional layer? And has your opinion swayed at all on who might win this match? Because like I said, I was I was firmly in the camp of there's no way Roman is losing. And now I'm like, Roman might actually lose this belt. And I think we started to tease it last week. 
and kind of start to explore the idea that not only could it happen, but should it happen? I think it's the right story to tell. I mean, what a way to wrap up the Thunderdome era than to have the guy that didn't really get a chance to celebrate an opportunity to take it all. I mean, really, what a way to pay homage to a wrestler that, that helped carry your company in the toughest times. In a new direction, If look, it, it, to be honest, if Vince was in charge, no way, no how would I even consider the thought of Drew McIntyre winning it. Now, I think the best way to do it, because, you know, sometimes – on these shows overseas, kind of like with the Saudis and stuff like that. It's basically an elevated house show. You have to do something to make people believe that, hey, this is not just a glorified house show where all the titles remain on the same people. You have to have a switch. So if you're going to go in that direction and the titles that are defended stay on the same characters, the one that would shock people is if Drew McIntyre in front of the home crowd gets the loudest ovation. What a way to enthuse a locker room what a way to renew roman reigns bro two years i mean that's a long time that's 110 podcasts with the same world champion nobody i mean bottom line a year should be the staple of okay we we know you're great i mean i never talked about aj styles winning the title for two years one year is a good staple and then you keep it fresh with the stories moving give it to drew make the people happy it'll make the weekend yeah it's it's one of those things that it is a long time. And I was like, man, two years. This guy's been chasing it for two years. They started going through like people that he has beat. He said, did a really good job with the film package on Friday night for Roman Reigns. And I was like, I totally forgot about that match. It's been that long. Like I forgot about that match that he had with, with Kevin Owens. Uh, the, the, the fact that how this all started with Jey Uso, like I had mentioned before, like I forgot about those things because it has been such a long, long run. Not counting the seven times that he's faced, faced Brock Lesnar in that time period. <laughs> so it's been incredibly long. Now, something else. A little bit long here. We've not had female tag team champions. We had a new tag team crowned on Monday night as they wrapped up the, the women's uh, tag team championship tournament. Raquel Rodriguez and Aaliyah defeat Dakota Kai and Io Sky. And this has a lot of people talking. And I just need to know, was it the right move for them to go over? Was it the right move to put the belts on Raquel Rodriguez and Aaliyah? We are all anticipating that Sasha Banks and Naomi are on their way back. We all anticipate the first thing they're going to do is going to get inserted into a, a, a title picture to end up challenging for those women's, women's championships that they never actually lost, that they just vacated when they walked out. I feel like Dakota Kai, Io Sky... Sasha Banks, Naomi could really tear the house down. Instead, Raquel Rodriguez and Aaliyah, a little bit greener, a little bit newer, they get the they get the straps. And I think that shocked everybody. I think that was one of those moves where everybody was like, wait, what? On top of it, Aaliyah got the pin. Which if you look at any of their matches, Aaliyah's been the one who usually takes the takes the, the brunt of the of the initial action. Raquel Rodriguez comes in, makes a save, and they get the win that way. What did you make about putting the tag belts on these two green or greener women? Absolutely element of surprise. I was definitely surprised that that was the way they went because you, you said it. The other two might have been more worthy of champions. But at the same time, if you are then going to have them drop the belt to Sasha, it's nice to kind of get that little bit of infusion of a title. Because, look, let's be honest, the women's championship is not really – the tag team is not really at the point where it's elevated. I think once Sasha and Naomi get it back, then you have an opportunity to then reestablish it and elevate it. So giving it to young people, it's kind of like, in a way, it's kind of like a TV title at this point. So it's fine. I get the debate. It was vigorous online saying, wait a minute, this wasn't worthy. This was something that was crazy. They disrespected those. Here we go again. But I thought for what it is, it was the right move. Yeah, I look, I like the element of surprise. I think we can all tell Raquel Rodriguez is in line for a monster push, and I think yes. this is a way to really introduce her to the crowd. Like now you have to pay attention to her. If you weren't paying attention before, and if you DVR'd Monday Night Raw or you DVR'd SmackDown, and her matches would come up and you just fast-forward right through them because you're like, okay, whatever. You now have to pay attention to this wrestler. Also, she did a lot of great things in NXT. She was like, She was great in NXT. I don't necessarily find her character captivating on the main roster, but now you're forced to pay attention to her. I anticipate a, a heel turn from her shortly, 
Uh, I would assume that she's going to get tired of Aaliyah at some point. She will end up beating Aaliyah, and it'll be kind of some of that same old Vince McMahon. We got to break the tag team up type of storyline to get Raquel Rodriguez on her own. But until then, you now have to pay attention to her. Again, huge surprise. Dakota Kai, Io Sky don't necessarily need titles. You're paying attention to them. You've been paying attention to them since the day that they showed up with Bailey. So you don't you don't necessarily have to put titles on them. Raquel Rodriguez, Aaliyah, honestly, I think it was the right move because now you've got two new women that that have basically been crowned, two new women that you have to pay attention to, and that helps strengthen that division, helps strengthen that roster. Dakota Kai, Io Sky didn't necessarily need that. You were paying attention already, and they didn't need they didn't need the help. Those two needed the help. And that gets into that conversation of do you need a belt? Is a belt a prop? Where are we at with it? Right. I think in this case, it works out just fine. I think it's kind of a wash. You now have helped bolster a, a roster of women by adding these two to the forefront of it. I think it was a good call. Now, we've got a massive pay-per-view. We've got Clash of the, uh, Class of the Castle. Let's get into our reviews. Actually, before we do that, there was a monstrous podcast with Triple H that took place. You got to listen to it. It's still, I still have to, to, to squeeze out, was it, I think it's about 75 minutes. Got to squeeze out about 75 Correct. minutes to listen to it because you said it was fantastic. What was your initial reaction to it and, and what did you love about it? Give us some highlights because, like I said, yes. I haven't had a chance to take yeah. it in yet. Yeah. Once I saw that it dropped, I was like, man, Ariel Helwani has really elevated himself to be among the top interviewers in the world of combat sports. And you could tell this is somebody that, through time and experience as a podcaster and in the work in media, has become such a smooth interviewer. And really the first step is if you're somebody doing a podcast or you're somebody that is looking to get in media, you have to absorb other stuff. You can't just do whatever it is you're doing. Do your own stuff, but you have to learn from other people. And Ariel just comes across as a natural, smooth individual that knows and ultra prepared for what he was talking about. So it just flowed into a conversation that I wish would have went four hours. I, I don't typically I can't consume Joe Rogan's four hour podcast. And I don't know how people a million people can consume that in this day and age. But I would have loved to have seen Triple H talk about everything and all things over the four uh, over the 72 minutes. Bro, it was everything it was talking about. His transition from where he was to the job. He talked about a couple of wrestlers that potentially could come back. He briefly touched on competition. He talked about his health scare, talked about the product. And it was such an engaging conversation. It was like Triple H trusted Ariel to give him information. And it was a wrestling podcast. It was not. And you can just tell the difference between somebody that does an interview with somebody they trust and somebody that's just doing it to kind of get through the 15 minutes. Triple H trusted Ariel, and it was just a – it was it was literally like two boys having a scotch, shooting the shit, and it was such a great, engaging conversation. I watched it like at 1 a.m. I was just wired. I was excited. I'm like, I want to watch this. So I stayed up, and I watched it because I, I really like good interviewers, and Ariel is, is among them. It, it just touched on so many good things. Uh and I'm not going to spoil it because you guys have to watch it. But uh, Ariel does a great job of bringing up some things that also may not be the things you want to talk about. And I think that the great part is he goes just for fun at the end. He goes, let's just bring up some four names and let's see if uh, if they're going to just tell me if you, if you think they're going to come back to WWE. And Triple H, obviously, the, the consummate pro that he is, also gives validation and reasons why some talent that are not on the air are not there. And he talked about, look, you're dealing with egos, you're dealing with people, and you're dealing with people that sometimes it, it's a two-way street. You can't force somebody to be all in, in in something when they have opportunities elsewhere. And he understands it. Listen, Triple H comes off as some guy that even when something like a crisis happens where Brock Lesnar leaves, he's not going to flip out. He's going to be like, okay, he's seen it before. Bro, remember, Triple H was part of some of the wildest stories ever told in wrestling with the click, the send-off in New York. So when Brock Lesnar leaves, he details how he handled it, and he kept it cool. And you learn leadership from someone like that who's 52 years old, and you realize, oh, man, you could lead so much better and do things so much differently by being able to reflect and, and do things. And you learn from Triple H's mind that this is the perfect dude. If there was an encapsulation of somebody who's perfect to lead WWE now and in the future, it was the man who spent 72 hours leading. And, and he learned from Vince. 
and he's going to do things his own way. I can't speak highly enough of that 72 minutes. You got to see it. It's, if you're a wrestling fan, you now have kind of the mantra, the beginning staple of the Triple H era. And boy, man, it was quality. And that's why I love podcasting. That's why I love it in that form. Now with videos, it's just an amazing opportunity in this day and age with content to see when you're interested in something, quality information being presented. And of course, I love Triple H, but you got it. When you watch that interview, you got to give credit to Ariel Helwani. Prepared, understood the material, understood the, the way to flow material. It was an expert master class in interviewing, and I loved it. Top to bottom, A+. plus. You could watch it multiple times and get multiple things from it. I highly recommend it. Yeah, and again, like you said, this is a guy in Triple H who has been there, done that. He's seen it all. So when things happen, he's like, okay, I get it. And he just kind of rolls with it. Never get, again, never gets too high, never gets too low. This is the one thing we talk about on, on our podcast. When we talk about leaders in sports, right? We, on the Doc and Jock show, we talk about captains and we talk about leadership and we talk about basically carrying people along and, and helping out. All those guys are very similar. Never get too high, never get too low. Always say kind of even keel. You've got one of the biggest names in wrestling walking out because the owner just quit maybe 45 minutes ago. What happens? Doesn't panic. Gets the guy back. The show must go on and just keeps things moving. Uh, I can't wait to listen to this. It, it sounds like it was a fantastic interview. Uh, this will be uh, this will be making it to my list of things that I must hear. So I'll be taking it in here very, very shortly. Now, like I said, we do have a massive pay-per-view. We do have Clash at the Castle. That is taking place on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I guess let's just jump into it. Uh, we'll kick it off with Bailey, Dakota Kai, Io Sky versus Bianca Belair, Asuka, and Alexa Bliss. How do you see this one playing out? <laughs> I looked at the rundown, and I saw some of the matches. And I'm like, oh, my God. I could literally make a case for every match going either way. It's crazy, like, right? Damn. I was like, God damn, Adam, this is kind of hard for me on Saturday morning. So <laughs> uh, I am going to go with my gut all the way. I don't care. You're kicking my ass this year. You kicked my ass the last couple of years. It's because I'm going to always go with my heart and what I want to see. So it just has the feel of Bailey and the opportunity for her to kind of get going. You can't bring her back and have her lose. The others are established. They can handle a loss. Bailey wins it. Yeah, and again, that's kind of how I looked at it, right? You got Bianca Belair, Asuka, Alexa Bliss. Bianca's on that team. They can handle a loss. I'm going to go Bailey, Dakota Kai, Io Sky. Uh, I just, I, I feel like at this point, get them a win. It really helps catapult them, and you can keep building on their story. I think they've got a very interesting story about to unfold. I feel like that's the right way to go. I feel like that's the right direction. We have the Intercontinental Championship. We've got Gunther versus Sheamus. Again, homecoming for Sheamus. Uh, Gunther, uh, champion. He's been a fantastic champion. In this match, I think Gunther's gonna gonna retain his belt. Who do you have? No, you can't. This is a for me. I, I see two title changes, and I see Sheamus obviously. And I know it's really good by doing that, and they probably hook me and trap me if it ends up uh, me being wrong. But Sheamus is a player who has never won the Intercontinental title. What a way to do it in a familiar land. So I think that it's time for Sheamus to be the new Intercontinental champion. All right, we've got the SmackDown Women's Championship. We've got Liv Morgan taking on Shayna Baszler. How do you see this one playing out? No chance, no how. Shayna walks away with the title, so give me Liv Morgan. Let's keep this train rolling, baby. See, I, I kind of feel like it's going to be a little bit closer than that. I think Liv Morgan's going to just eke out a win. Maybe she does something a little bit underhanded. Uh, maybe Shayna gets Ooh. distracted. We'll see what happens, but I think Liv Morgan just ekes out a win and is able to retain Seth Rollins, Matt Riddle, they're finally gonna make, they're gonna finally meet, they're gonna collide. There was a really nice promo that was done. Uh, they you end up going to break, you come back, and they play a little bit of something that wasn't supposed to be aired, and I thought it was great. It added a little bit of realism, a little bit of real life heat here, uh, where, where Seth Rollins goes at Matt Riddle, calls him out for his divorce with his wife and her taking the kids. Matt Riddle fires up, drops a couple F-bombs that get censored out. I thought it was a really, really great job of, of creating some intriguing story. Seth Rollins, Matt Riddle, I think Matt Riddle gets the win just because I think he needs it more. I don't really have a good answer as to who wins this just because I feel like this is such a such a, 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 a evenly contested, and both these guys are, are at that point where they're both kind of made dudes. I think Matt Riddle wins this and and. 
keeps it going. See, this is the part where my thinking could fuck me royally because if Drew, uh, if Drew McIntyre wins it, then the natural thing would be to potentially then have Seth Rollins be the next guy because you want to elevate it. So this is really kind of like a uh, status check for Matt Riddle, who earned his first name back. Hey, Triple H, good shit there. Good decision making. It's Matt Riddle. You're doing real stuff. And you have an opportunity to use his real name. So I'm, I'm happy with, uh, I'm happy with the change that we get to see Austin Theory, Matt Riddle back, back in the fold with their true character names. But, uh, it's interesting because you look at it and you say, either way, I think the next in line, is it Seth Rollins or is it Matt Riddle? Both epically need an opportunity to, to take the next step. Who do you go with? You got Riddle. I just have to go with the guy that looks like the potential perfect foil for uh, a nice fall run at, at Survivor Series against Drew McIntyre, and that's going to be Seth Rollins. I think that Seth cheats, does something unsavory, will do anything to win. Matt Riddle's there on the cusp, but in my mind, how I would do it, you have th- one of the top three wrestlers in the world. You can't have, in the end, you devalue Seth Rollins by having him lose three matches to Cody Rhodes, and then a few to Matt Riddle, that makes no sense in character development. You have to have Seth win a couple feuds. And I think he's he's the guy that's next. Riddle's right there. 1A Seth Rollins, 1A minus is Matt Riddle. But it has to be Seth Rollins. It just has to be. I, I, look, I, I don't really disagree with, with where you're going with it. Um, I just see this story unfolding a little bit different. But I do like the direction that you're in. And honestly... I could be swayed to go with Seth Rollins because I do feel like it's that of a, that much of a fine line between the two. So I, I look, I think you have a solid pick there. Uh, we have Edge and Rey Mysterio taking on the Judgment Day. I think the Judgment Day wins this, and I think the way the Judgment Day wins this is Dominic finally goes heel, finally joins the Judgment Day. There's been a lot being made with him and Rhea Ripley, with Dominic and Rhea Ripley. I think that plays an integral part. I think Edge and Rey Mysterio end up losing. I think Dominic is upset that Rey chose Edge over himself, and that's kind of the direction I see this going, and I think that sets Dominic up for a nice run here in the future. Absolutely. I, I mean, th- th- that's the seed that they planted, and you and I bought it hook, line, and sinker, so give me the judgment day. They need a win, too, because you let uh, Edge defeat um, Damian Priest on Monday Night Raw in Canada. You now got to return the favor, otherwise – the Judgment Day is going to flop before they take off. All right, the the one that 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 has it all. The the basically the, the reason that we're all tuning in does Roman a, does Roman Reigns retain his championship and beat Drew McIntyre, or does Drew McIntyre do the unheard of and dethrone Roman Reigns after over two hundred days as champion and win in his hometown in his home country? How do you see this unfolding for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship? See. This is the, the, the tough part when you have the producer's brain and you start thinking, okay, what's going to generate the most buzz on a holiday weekend? If Roman Reigns wins, we get to Monday and we're like, okay, no buzz, no nothing. You could talk about other type things like, okay, what kind of freak shit did Seth Rollins do, shit like that, what, what happens? But bottom line, cuz, 4 o'clock, Saturday, 1, 2, 3, Drew McIntyre wins. What are we talking about for the next 48 hours? What a moment, the video, the celebration, the social media content, the partying that Drew could do in his home country. Just team content would indicate that over a holiday weekend to generate the most buzz, what? Roman Reigns lost to Drew? Was that right? Was that not right? The debates, the the way in which the match goes down, does Drew align with somebody and, and do something different? Does something unusual happen? Does somebody cost Roman Reigns the, the championship? Does something weird happen? I just can't picture not taking advantage of all those hours of juicy content and debate that can be spewed out online. So for me, it has to be Drew McIntyre. It's time. Let's make this. So otherwise, if you do it, then really in the end for three years, we just haven't had anything inconsequential other than Goldberg botching matches against The Undertaker and other wrestlers and Triple H having uh, last matches with Randy Orton and all those kind of things. Nothing would have been of consequence from all these overseas shows. It would really make it hard to invest if you don't get some level of, hey, make me watch your show. This is how you do it. Drew McIntyre wins it. 
Yeah, so I'm going to lean towards Drew McIntyre as well, and I think his next storyline will be against Karrion Cross. Remember, let's not forget Karrion oh, Cross yes, played yes, in the wings, yes. uh, attacked Drew McIntyre. I feel like that is that is a great direction that they could go. Uh, again, that's okay, more I got a face heel I got stuff. A question. So, yes. yeah, I, yeah, I got a question. Just in terms of booking, is it better to draw the ultimate heat if Roman Reigns is you know down and out and he's about to get pinned? And carrying cross comes in and costs Drew McIntyre in his home country. That is also another way to sell Ooh, tickets. But that, that is, you know what I mean. One, two, like he's he he like Drew McIntyre clearly is going to win it, and all of a sudden some dude pulls him out of the ring and it's carrying cross. That is a way to elevate a few to the highest of high levels. But I just think that what an, uh, the belt, the belt being taken off somebody that had it for two years is a much more of a symbol than starting off a heel feud with a Karrion Cross. Think about this, too. If that was the case, then what you could do is you could transition to a three-way match where yes. you have 30 minutes and entrances between Roman Reigns and yeah. Karrion Cross. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So let's see how it kicks off. But you're right. I mean, Karrion Cross, Seth Rollins, there's going to be a lot of people waiting if, if Drew wins it. So it's a good time, man. It's a good time. I just hope they do it. I hope they have the guts to do it. All right. So just to quickly recap. We both have Bailey, Dakota Kai, and Io Sky beating Bian- Bianca Belair, Asuka, and Alexa Bliss. Uh, we differ on Sh- Sheamus and Gunther. Uh, you've got Sheamus retaining, or you got Sheamus winning. I've got Gunther retaining. Liv Morgan, we both have retaining over Shayna Baszler. We both differ with Seth Rollins and Matt Riddle. I've got Matt Riddle. You have Seth Rollins. We both think the Judgment Day beats Edge and Rey Mysterio, and it has something to do with Dominic and Rhea Ripley. And we both think Drew McIntyre unseats Roman Reigns. This will be really weird because when we look back on these results on Sunday morning, we could be totally wrong, and it could be for a good laugh. We'll see what the heck happens. Now, AEW had a program going on. We've had a whole lot going on with WWE, but AEW has a has a program going on, and AEW has a monster pay-per-view this Sunday. And we're continuing this build uh, for for All Out. And we weren't really sure what our main event was going to be. And honestly, I didn't know how the hell they were going to get us to the main event because I felt like they booked themselves in a corner. And what you had was you had John Moxley come out, cut a very impassioned promo, and throw down a signed contract. He says, I don't care who's in the ring. I'm whipping their ass. It's what it is. You want some, come get some. Throws a contract down in the middle of the ring and walks out. I kind of would have assumed that there would have been 96 wrestlers in the back chomping at the bit to get that contract to face John Moxley. But one ace was it, ace steel comes walking down to the ring and grabs that contract and balls it up and shoves it in his shirt pocket. And that kind of lets you know the direction that we were going. And I was pissed, did not like it. I'm going to read you some messages from our group chat because I was I almost threw, you know, I've got a very nice, massive TV. I got an 85 inch in my living room, takes up a whole entire wall. I was about to throw my TV, my couch, four of my five dogs through my TV because I was furious. I was pissed at what we ended up getting and what ended up unfolding. What we got was what I'm calling the sad boy CM Punk (laughs) storyline. And this is this is kind of how they built to to all out. Basically, CM Punk comes out and he's sad and woe is me and my foot's broken, but it wasn't broken and. It's 100%, but it's the new 100%. And they've been trying to kill me since I was a baby with a umbilical cord wrapped around my head. But they couldn't take me out then. And John Moxley, you can't take me out now. And sad, woe is me. Ace Steel comes up, fires him up, drops an F-bomb on TV, which was – that was probably the coolest part of this whole thing. Otherwise, this whole thing sucked in my opinion. Slap CM Punk. CM Punk ends up in the crowd and is like, we are Chicago. Also, I fucking hate Chicago, so fuck Chicago. If you're listening to this and you're from Chicago, fuck you and fuck Chicago. Anyways, this all unfolds, and this is what we got. We've got CM Punk, who was destroyed about ten days ago in under three minutes, challenging <laughs> John Moxley again. And hold on, I just want to give you, I just want to give you my mental state where we were at as this was as this was unfolding. You ended up chiming in. What a weird way to go with CM Punk. They should have just did this without the match last week, which I agree. If this was the direction we were going to end up in, why give us the match for free? Why do it in three minutes? thought it was stupid. I, on the other hand, a little bit more impassioned, 
and I, on the other hand, a little bit more edgy and angry. And I'll be honest with you, I'm probably a little bit more unstable than you. But I'm like, fuck AEW, fuck CM Punk, bitch, fuck this whole thing, what a bunch of shit, how fucking awful. As you can tell, I was kind of in rapture with this. And then you're like, I didn't think CM Punk needed a personality crisis. <laughs> you're over here laughing at it, and I'm fuming. I'm fuming, like, on the verge of tears, I am so upset with this. I said, way to overthink and overbook this, Tony. Fucking sucking the nut hair sweat off CM Punk. <laughs> when I go back and read these, it does make me laugh yeah. sometimes. And then Kenny's like, wow, what did I miss? Because Kenny, I'm assuming, was at work. And then you, you come in and you kind of... <laughs> You kind of just give them a little bit of, of color as to what took place. You're like, they made CM Punk have a crisis of confidence that was renewed, <laughs> in quotations, by getting bitch slapped by H- Ace Steel. <laughs> like, your commentary's great. And I'm like, Kenny, it was trash. <laughs> I'm just having a moment here, and I'm just pissed, and I'm sorry that you two had to fucking weather that storm. And then Kenny ends up watching it about 10 minutes later, and he's like, honestly, it wasn't that bad. Mox got a great promo. promo. And that punk thing was a little bit weak, but not terrible. I don't fully understand why it needs to be a rematch. It wasn't like he hauled up seconds after the slap. I think it was supposed to be hauled up as seconds after the slap. Yeah, It's the best thing in wrestling. Nah, it's trash also. Nah. I was like, that was horrible. Who is interested in this match? It's a trash angle. Also, Punk and Chicago both go someplace else. Moxley was great. I'm over CM Punk. And you're like, ugh. It, it was, it was, to me, this was a, a half ass weak build. And this was yeah, absolute yeah. garbage, what we got. And I look, yeah. I'll be honest with you. I'm not interested in watching this on this pay per view. Before, I was giving you dollar bills. I was going to back a, a AEW and be like, here, I want to see this match. Because I thought I thought CM Punk was going to win this. Obviously, in Chicago, CM Punk's winning this match. It's how it's going. Instead, you give us John Moxley. Blew my mind. It was three minutes. I'm good. We don't need to see no more. I'm ready to move on. What did you make of this? Because honestly, you were much more level headed than me. I was. I was going through it, and you were just kind of like, "It's bad, but what are you going to do?" Yeah. Where, yeah, where are you at with this? Not what I was thinking, in which because it makes no sense. I mean, this is, I guess, how you clean up having them have a three minute match. It makes sense to weave it. It's different, but you didn't need it. It's box office. Like sometimes promoters have to tell stories in different ways, and sometimes you say, "Oh, let's do this," and you didn't need it. It's just, I want the belt. I want the belt. Let's go. Who's the man? You know, you could even tie it into the past. I uh, I set the stage for you, and uh, you're an unappreciative idiot. You've always been number three. I mean, you had this. Sometimes you just have to take the easy route. I think the simple route would have been just CM Punk saying, I, I can't believe I'm standing here opposite of you. I thought you were number three in everything you've ever done. You know, I thought that by now you would have, uh, the best thing would have been to say, hey, I thought by now you would have drank yourself to death by now. I'm really proud of you for being able to stay sober for 30 days. Good for you. And, uh, you know, stick with the line that was a money line. He says, hey, you're the wrestler, but I'm the draw. And you just keep going. You didn't need to have the match. You didn't need to tell any story. I didn't ever need to see a steal. I didn't ever need to see uh cm punk rise up from the ashes of despair of confidence i didn't need any of that it's two dudes the top of their game go at it real simple shit you didn't need you just needed the match you didn't need anything you didn't have to have any sort of build in any sort of way so when you do it and you have this it just makes everybody go what the hell is this i don't want to see it you know i think you know if you go back and watch when the contract is laid out the crowd's chanting mjf that's yeah. not what you want yeah. to have happen in a feud. That's not what like, you want to have happen. How much would that arena have blew if MJF yeah. showed up? That's that's bad. That's bad on you guys for not making the storyline good enough so that the two people actually in it are the draw. So you're absolutely right. Your fury should be because at the highest level of creative content, you should be able to kind of hit the home run when it's there. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, if the pitcher tells you, it's like, hey, the pitcher tells you I'm going to throw a 90-mile-an-hour pitch, and you still don't hit it out of the park, something's definitely wrong. It's CM Punk and Moxley, and you guys found a way to devalue it where you and I are like, well, I'm really not interested in watching it. Yeah, it's, to me, this was a, a, a shit build, and I'm, like, I'm just like, I'm not interested. You had me gripped, and you had me <laughs> lined up a week ago, and boy, what you did was just so, so absolutely underwhelming. Now, I, I look, I do think there are going to be other interesting matches on this card, and it's a very big card. 
I thought yep. they could have went in a little bit of a direct, different direction with the trios. And I do want to touch yeah, on yeah. on the Kenny Omega open for for the trios uh, finale <laughs> on his side of the division. I thought it was the ultimate troll, troll job on um, on Will Ospreay. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Again, they they have some heat. There's some stuff going back and forth. If you follow both of their Twitter handles, it's it's absolutely great. What did you think of Kenny Omega's opening, where he basically trolls the shit out of Will Ospreay, and everything he does is that much better than Will Ospreay? I thought it was great. Uh, it was absolutely perfect, and the delivery by the ring announcer, Justin, was absolutely perfect. And it's Kenny Omega, who holds a 3 and one record over Will Ospreay, and da-da-da-da-da, and he has more marketing sales and more jerseys and T-shirt sales, and, and the way he delivered it by saying over Will Ospreay was great. And yes. Boy, did the match, boy, did the match deliver. Holy cow. And I just, unfortunately, my note, though, is just about how does, I, I highlighted in my note, how does AEW let Will Ospreay get on a plane? The man is one of the best four wrestlers in the world. And I know, look, you've got to figure out a way to say, hey, New Japan, here's a million dollars. Thank you for the development of this beautiful character. We want Ozzy open. Whatever you need, we'll give it to you. We want Will Ospreay here. For Will Ospreay to tweet out after, well, it looks like my time in the AEW has, has come to an end. It stinks because, man, just from the time you started talking about him three years ago, he's gotten incrementally better from that. Yeah. Great moves, great action, pure natural, 29, 30 years old, prime, top three wrestlers in the world, and you let him leave. That's not how you succeed in a potential war with somebody that's newly hungry in, in Triple H. That's not how you do it. You can't let Will Ospreay leave. He has to be on your show each and every week, talking, wrestling, engaging. you got to have you got to have Osprey Omega to kick off January or to kick off the next pay-per-view. You can't let Aussie Open leave. It's, it's, it's unbelievable that Will Osprey is not going to be part of AEW. That is crazy to think about. Well, I'll tell you what this sets up for. What this sets up for is Will, Kenny Omega and Will Osprey meeting at Wrestle Kingdom yeah. coming yep, up. Yep. I believe it's in January. So yep. that's the direction that we're heading. So Will Osprey will have to go back to New Japan again. They're the AEW is borrowing him. It's a talent trade. Uh, it's similar to what we see in soccer. You're a huge soccer fan, so you know all about it. Um, yep. He'll go back to, to yeah, he's on loan exactly. He's he's going to go back to New Japan, and then uh, they will continue the story, building it over yep. in New Japan. It'll be interesting. I think what we get at Wrestle Kingdom will be absolutely fantastic. On top of that, Kenny Omega does some of his best work at Wrestle Kingdom, so it should be really really good. I do want to double back over to the other side. Of, of the bracket. Now, we've got Hangman Page and we've got the Dark Order making it to the trios final to take on Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. Would you have preferred an undisputed elite storyline making it yeah. to the other side to take on Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks? Remember, when Kenny Omega was on his way out to go recover from all of the injuries that he had, Adam Cole was like, don't worry, I'll step up. There seemed to be some friction between the two, a little bit of feuding. You also had the Undisputed Elite turn on the Young Bucks and beat them down in the middle of the ring over these trios over these trios belts. Now, there are things that have unfolded, and, and it's probably why we're not getting it, but would you have much preferred that storyline? Just to give you a little bit of background. Stick around for the news and notes. There's there's a bit of an update on one of the, one of the characters involved in this storyline and and basically their contract with AEW. Um, you've got Kyle O'Reilly, who it's rumored that he's sidelined with with a neck fusion and he's indefinitely sidelined. I haven't been able to to back this up with anything else, so I'm going with rumor on it. So he's out indefinitely because they're not sure what's going on with his neck. Um, Bobby Fish was dealing with an injury. Adam Cole still dealing with an injury. So these guys are pretty beat up, and they're not healthy enough to compete in the ring. But would that story of line had a little bit more juice, a little bit more flow for you instead of Hangman Page and the Dark Order? I think Hangman Page, Dark Order, it's a good second because obviously Kenny Omega and Hangman Page have a history. But I think the Undisputed Elite storyline with Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks would have been way better. It would have been, but unfortunately – you don't have, you know, them at the level where you need to be. And that stinks because with Adam Cole and everything going on, that was a premier entity that was featured heavily in a prominent uh, company. So to see where they're at, it, they're not there. They're not worthy of being number two. So it makes sense that uh, Hangman Page and the Dark Order are going to be there because then it makes 
the win believable and you have an opportunity now to validate the trios belt. We, we know what's going to happen. I mean, we'll take a second on that prediction, but um, I, I just wish it, it just stinks because injuries were part of the story for, for AEW in 2022 and the undisputed uh, and uh, Adam Cole and his faction, unfortunately bore the brunt of it and it sucks. Yeah. It's, it's, I feel like it could have just been done a little bit better. Now, yep. What we've got for All Out on Sunday wow. is freaking crazy. This card is nuts. When I was going through putting it down on our rundown, I was like, Jesus, this is going to take forever. This this is going to be one of those pay-per-views that's like a six-hour long pay-per-view because they've got so right. much just busting it's it. The it's the WrestleMania. It, for those who don't know, it's their WrestleMania. September, it it's their biggest show. Surprises, Chicago, uh, all the wrestling fans. And what makes it great, outside of the wrestling – the crowd are the marks. They love everything. They're usually they're usually into it. So it'll be up to AEW because I could sense too that this might also be a crowd that could turn on some shit and start chanting, "This is boring. Move this along." Some stuff that may not be stuff that's been used to by AEW. So they better they better deliver and, and keep the crowd into it and tell the right stories and, and pace the card the right way. Absolutely. And we're we're going to kick this off with a ladder match for the AEW Championship. Uh, you got Claudio Castagnoli, Ray Phoenix, Rush, Dante Martin, Andre El Idolo, Penta, Wheeler Yuta, and a mystery opponent. Now, the way we normally do this is if you if you guess the person because we have a multi man match, you get a point for that. Uh, that point and that win goes towards your overall points, so that could help swing which direction. Uh, that that overall point goes. So you can double up and get two points. If you guess the mystery opponent, you get an additional bonus point. So your prediction has a whole lot that could happen here. This could be worth almost three points by itself and help pull you, shrink that gap. Where I'm leading by five points could really help shrink that gap. Now, mystery entrant. I have no idea who it is. Normally things leak, and I'll usually have a bit of an idea, and I'll give you that information here. I'm just going by what we've talked about. Could that be the spot where MJF shows up? Does MJF show up in this match? He win this match, and then you have him take on CM Punk. I would much prefer seeing him take on John Moxley, but is that is that the mystery entrant? Do you think that's a possibility? It could be. Yeah. Could it be Adam Cole? Could it be somebody else? We'll see, but... Um, I I don't know that what the possible plans could be. I think that uh, now you said this match, the winner gets an opportunity to face the winner of the John Moxley match. So it's definitely, definitely something to look at at who it could be. But but see, for me, I have other names as well. So I'm going to uh, renew review. Um, I'm going to give my thoughts when it's my turn to pick because unfortunately you're kicking my ass and I have to go into competitive mode. So lay it out <laughs> okay. for me. Who, who, who do you got? I've got, I've got Claudio winning this one. Um, looking at yep. the names yep. and I have no idea who the mystery entrance is going to be. So it would be silly for me to speculate. I was just throwing a name out there because we've been talking about different yep. stuff. Uh, I think, Ru- I think rush is getting a huge or Roosh is getting a huge push. Um, yep. I don't know where that's going to go. Andrade's in this match. I know Andrade's a little bit unhappy with what's going on with this character. Not sure what's going to happen there. Bray and Penta, I think they're fantastic. I think they're better together than they are separated. Dante Martin's really interesting because he's amazing in the ring. But I think you've got some, you've got something here with Claudio. I think Claudio gets this. And I think a Claudio, Claudio avenging John Moxley is an interesting storyline. Or you have the you have the the Blackpool Combat Club basically beating each other for supremacy of that club. I think is an interesting storyline as well. Okay, um, yeah. Who's your pick for the surprise? Claudio. Oh, for a surprise? Bro, I have no idea, no clue. I'll, I'll just throw yeah. MJF out there. I don't know if it's going to be him. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, I have to agree with you. But here are the candidates because I also have also just thought about the people that potentially I would like to see. I would love to see Adam Cole. I would love to see uh, ta- ta- what is it, Takashka, potentially. Oh, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Takashka could be somebody that is just absolutely fanta- fantastic, MJF. Um, but an outside name, potentially, Samoa Joe, I think could come in. And, and, and dude, dude comes in, has a title, but is barely used. So there's a lot of good name potential. But absolutely, I think it's going to be either – Adam Cole or MJF, but 
uh, the best plan would be to have MJF return because it's a surprise. It would pop the crowd. So it, it, sh- it should be MJF. And I have also Claudio winning it because he's, it would be great, uh, for him to continue his push, um, to validate his Ring of Honor status and a potential world title opportunity. He can't win it, the world title just yet, but I think him getting an opportunity is great. Yeah. And look, I like, I like the direction that, uh, that you're going in with your thought process here. I think Takeshka, Samoa baby, Joe, Takeshka, prove us wrong. So, <laughs> Takeshka, baby. He's the man. Samoa Joe was a guy that I totally forgot about and he just wrapped up right. filming a show. Uh, so he is, he's coming back. So that would be a great way to reintroduce him would be in this match. I think that'd be fantastic. So I do like where your head's at. All right. We've got our TBS championship. We've got Jade Cargill versus Athena. How do you see this one playing out? Uh, Jade Cargill. Absolutely. Um, I, I think there's going to be great, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those matches where you look at it and you say, there's going to be opportunities to kind of dip out a little bit and focus and uh, scroll on your phone. The Jade Cargill match might be the one for me. Yeah, look, I still think Jay Cargill's a draw. As much as I find her to not be a very interesting wrestler, um, I would love for Athena to win this. I think there's going to be some outside forces that that yeah, end up yeah. causing Athena to lose. I'm going to go towards Jade Cargill. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if Athena won, but I just feel like Athena's right now a bigger draw than Athena is. Now, we've got Wardlow and FTR versus Jay Lethal and Chris Sabin and Alex Shelley. For me, this is really simple. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Anytime somebody new from a different promotion comes in, they always lose. And I love Chris Sabin. Yeah. I love Alex Shelley. I thought they cut a great promo yeah. in Chicago the other night. Um, they feel the same way I feel about Chicago, and I think that's great. If you're from Detroit or you're from the metro Detroit area, you should feel that way about Chicago. Seriously, fuck Chicago. Uh, and I love their promo because they essentially said that. They're going to end up losing. Wardlow, FTR are going to win this. Um, I really do, like I said, love Chris Saban, Alex Shelley. I think they do a great job in the ring. They've been some of my favorite wrestlers of all time for a very, very long time. Uh, but I don't see them winning. I got Wardlow, FTR winning this. Facts. Wardlow, FTR. I can't wait for the pop when FTR comes out. All right. We've got Christian Cage versus Jungle Boy. This This match has been building for a hot minute. I think Christian Cage does the job. I think Jungle Boy gets the win. Uh, I think it helps elevate Jungle Boy to that next level in his career. You could always end up having uh, Luchasaurus play a role in this, and he could he could go one of two ways. So that's always an outside shot, always a possibility. But I'm going to pick Jungle Boy for the win. Absolutely. you got to pay it off. It's a great build. What a perfect opportunity for Christian to elevate one of the star- young stars in the company. Definitely Jungle Boy wins it. All right, Ricky Starks versus Powerhouse Hobbs. Powerhouse Hobbs has been stalking, chasing, trying to annihilate Ricky Starks. They're finally going to get the ring and touch each other. This is going to be absolutely a fantastic match. Powerhouse Hobbs looks like he's in incredible shape. That looks like a bohemoth, thick-ass man. He is a big dude. I could see either one of these guys winning this. I really could. I think you send the fans home happy. I think Ricky Stark gets the win. How do you see this one playing out? Uh, Ricky Starks, no, uh, it's great. I know that you want to see the underdog, but you got a behemoth. You got to move in that direction. It's Powerhouse Hobbs. All right, I'd like, I'm not mad at it, man. I'm really not. I think I'll pop just as hard if Powerhouse Hobbs beats Ricky Starks, which is which tells you about how you feel about both these characters. Like you're up on both yes. of them, which is awesome because two years ago you were like Powerhouse who? What's he doing? And now you're like, man, if he beats Ricky Starks, that's great. So it, it tells you about the the overall character development and the arc of that character. How's the black for Darby Allen, Sting, and hey, Miro's going to get in the ring. Miro's back, baby. How do you see this one playing out? Ooh, well, yeah, it's tough because you would naturally assume Miro and Sting, very good combination here. The two guys that uh, potentially we all want to keep seeing elevate and, and, and seeing on the screen. So give me uh, Miro and Sting. All right. Uh, I look. I don't mind that. Uh, I think at some point House of Black should should probably get their right. comeuppance. And you got uh, a, a legend in Sting. You got a guy who's incredibly over in Darby Allen, and you got another guy who's incredibly over in Darby Allen. So I'm gonna go with Darby Allen and Sting and Miro as well. I think it's a solid pick. Now we've got the AEW Tag Team Championships. We've got Swerve in My Glory versus The Acclaim. Now, this is a match that I pop, will pop hard for because I love the scissoring. Yes. 
Uh, I don't think <laughs> Swerve in My Glory loses. Uh, I think they end up retaining their belts, and uh, I, I don't really think it's all that difficult. All right, I got you. Look, I don't know if you saw, but there's been a campaign to get the Scissor Me Daddy ass shirt made. And at first there were issues, but I think I saw that from one of the wrestlers in the acclaimed, I think that shirt's out there. So you want to pick up that shirt? I got you, bro. That's cool. Get it. Absolutely. I think you, you'd be the perfect guy to rock that. Scissor me, daddy <laughs> ass. I, 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 I think it's great that, uh, I, I don't know if, if it was one of those real accounts or fake accounts, but I know I saw those words on a shirt. So it'll be fun to see, but they don't have a chance. Mostly people want to see the opportunity for, what kind of rap is this dude going to deliver in Chicago? So they got to get the mic right, the audio right, and hopefully it's a legendary legendary diss track on whoever and whatever comes about from the great acclaimed. Because, bro, everybody loves the acclaimed, but everybody loves their entrance just a little bit more than their in-ring work. The, the champs retain. That, that's, that's the truth, too. That's the truth. All right, so we've got the AEW World Trios Championship. We've got Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks taking on the Dark Order and Hangman Page. Obviously, there are storylines here. There are are a ton of things that you can do with Hangman Page and Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks win this. Like, I don't know. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time here. Nope, nope. Let's move along. Next match. All right, Brian Danielson and Chris Jericho. Who's the best wrestler alive? Basically, they're fighting for the hearts of Daniel Garcia, how do you see this one playing out? I have no idea how it's going to play out, but I, I can't <laughs> imagine. Chris, I, I let you I go can't first. Imagine, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know how it's going to play. I don't know what the best way is. It's look. It's just a match people want to see. But in the end, however it's going to shake out with however angles you want to have, I would presume this is one in which you want to have Garcia get over, so you have him potentially align with the good guys. So I'm going with Danielson and uh, give potentially Chris Jericho an opportunity to get back at uh, Daniel Garcia in the ring. So that might be the easiest, simple, simpleton solution, but let's keep it simple. That's the theme of the day. Daniel Garcia has been wrestling with, hey, uh, which mentor am I going to align with? And he aligns with Danielson. And here we go. Danielson wins. Yeah, I think Danielson's going to get the win, too, because this match is surrounded around who's the best wrestler of all time. That <clears throat> It's very specific what they say. Listen to what they say. So I'm yep. going to go with Brian Danielson. I think he's a better overall wrestler. I think Chris Jericho is the greatest superstar of all time. I think Chris, Rest- Chris Jericho is the greatest professional wrestler of all time. But best wrestler, like wrestling. Yes, right. Wrestling. Danielson. All right. Interim AEW World Champion. We've got Tony Storm taking on Jamie Hayter, taking on Hikaru Shida, who looks fantastic since she's been back in the ring, and Britt Baker. Uh, I know who I've got winning this match. Who do you have winning this match? I've already got mine written down. I want to see if we're on the I'm same wrong. page. I hope I'm not wrong, but I need to have Tony Storm win it. But I feel like if I'm wrong, it's going to be DMD because she's the, the next biggest star and she's the heel. And you have the opportunity then to potentially have uh, Thunder Rosa come back and get it off of her. But in the end, I like Tony Storm to, to be the interim champ. All right, look. Thunder Rosa's reign as champion has been absolutely abysmal. It's been horrible. Uh, I thought Harkaro Shida had a better title run than Thunder Rosa has. Uh, I've been really yep. disappointed with Thunder Rosa's title run. It's been it's been really upsetting because she is so good in the ring, and it's been absolute. It, honestly, no other words for it other than trash. It's been absolute trash. Britt Baker, this this division was its strongest when Britt Baker was the champion, and honestly. There weren't a ton of female wrestlers who could really hold a candle with her in the ring. But for some reason, the, the the division itself was stronger with her in the ring. They were going to take the belt off of Thunder Rosa and put it on Tony Storm and see where that got them. That was the original plan. Thunder Rosa gets hurt. I think you still stick with the person you were going to put it on. You've seen something in Tony Storm. You think she's she can do something. I think you stick with Tony Storm. If you have to pivot... You can take it off of her with Britt Baker. It's not that big a deal. Give it a three-week run. Give it a four-week run. It's not like your women's division is worth a shit. You've got Jade Cargill as a champion. What are we talking about here? So put it on Thunder. Put it on Tony Storm. If it doesn't work, take it off her with Britt Baker and let's roll. Then you could have a, a great match between Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa whenever she's healthy to return and probably just leave the belt on Britt Baker at that time if that's the direction we have to go in. So I'm going to go Tony Storm as well. That was what I had written down before you even said it. 
moves us on to our AEW championship match. And this is going to pain me to say this, but we're in Chicago. And what the crybaby wants, the crybaby gets. CM Punk's going to win this match. I'm going to be pissed. It's going to ruin a great pay-per-view. How do you see this playing out? No, that would be the dumbest thing ever. Yeah, it'd be, stu- it'd be effing stupid. And you know yeah. what? It's what's going to yeah. happen. You know oh, why? Because oh, Tony boy. Khan is a fucking my mark, and he loves CM yeah. Punk. Yeah, yeah. If that happens, I'm going right to my phone to see how we react to it. I can't see that. John, you can't devalue Moxley because he is the guy. So you absolutely go in a different direction. If you have Adam Cole return as the Joker, then you have MJF cost uh, CM Punk. You have a swerve where it's not CM Punk's fault. The next potential feud comes in. But no way, no how do, does does AEW devalue their title. That would be a, a dumb move. I think that the, 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 the correct move with the fans that are there is to have a violent, aggressive match back and forth. Maybe something wonky happens, something crazy. You know, look, if you have CM Punk win, then you've got to form a faction. You know, potentially, you know, if, if the rumors are swirling online, which you happen to see, MJF comes down, everybody thinks, okay, he's going to fuck CM Punk, and MJF aligns with CM Punk, and you potentially start the formation of a real badass heel group that could potentially be uh, something to pay attention to. So we'll see what happens. Um, I'm wondering how big of a direction they're going to go with this, with this matchup. But in the end, for me, it's going to be John Moxley winning it. All right, we 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 differ there. There there are definitely points okay. to be made here, and definitely yes. definitely a chance for for us to have our gap closed as far as me leading yes. in ten to five and calling the card. Yes. Real quick, the recap: we both have Claudio winning the the ladder match, and we both have MJF being the surprise entrant. Uh, we both have Jade Cargill retaining her championship over Athena. We both have Wardlow and FTR beating Jay Lethal and Chris Sabin and now Alex Shelley. We both have Jungle Boy defeating Christian. We, we split and we differ on Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks. You've got Powerhouse Hobbs. We both have Darby Allen, Sting, and Miro beating House of Black. We both have Swerve in My Glory retaining over the Acclaimed. We both have Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks winning the brand new Trios Championships over Hangman Page in the Dark Order. We both have Brian Danielson beating Chris Jericho. We both have Tony Storm winning the interim AEW Women's Championship. And we differ again as to who comes out the AEW champion. You've got John Moxley. I've got CM Punk for very different reasons. It'll be a great card. It'll be very, very interesting. Uh, I do have to get your selection before we move into some news and notes for the show of the week. I thought we had a great week of wrestling. Uh, I absolutely was appalled by what we had with Dynamite in a 15-minute segment. Overall, I thought it was a very, very good show. I thought it was, again, well-paced. Um, uh, just out of spite, I'm going to give the point to Monday Night Raw for myself yep. this week. Uh, I'm not sure which direction you want to go. Yep. Yeah, Monday Night Raw was definitely fantastic. I thought the builds to all the feuds were great. Absolutely show of the week. The point goes to Monday Night Raw. Now, cuz, after two previews, I'm ready. Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? All right, a ton to get in, ton to get into here. So, do some top guys in AEW have heat? For weeks, we've been discussing the heat backstage at AEW, and while the heat magnet may have landed on FTR, Fightful Select is reporting that the heavily decorated tag team has been removed from the AEW video game Fight Forever. It seems this was a late last minute call to have them scratched from the video game. Now, FTR has. Had every has had FTR has every right to be upset as being included in the game. You earn a hefty bonus, and the two of them even recorded spots for the video game itself. Speculation is the characters may be hidden or downloadable at another time, but that doesn't explain why FTR would be so upset as they would still be in line for that massive bonus. So we'll have to kind of watch this as this unfolds a little bit here. WWE may have had a change of heart. Andrew Zarian previously reported that Monday Night Raw was set to become TV 14 on the July 18th episode. Well, that never really happened, and a lot has changed. With Vince McMahon retiring, Triple H taking over creative, Stephanie McMahon and Nick Khan becoming co-CEOs. Late last week, an update from PW Insider revealed that WWE 
doesn't have any current plans for Raw to change its rating, according to Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio. This is because WWE doesn't want to upset the advertisers so early into a new regime. He stated, I think that the new regime, I think it's the new regime, and that could be Stephanie instead of Vince. Vince may, Vince was maybe considering it. Stephanie's thing is, let's not make Mattel unhappy, and we don't need it. You know what I mean? And they don't. And that's just because Raw ratings and WWE ratings as a whole have been getting healthier each and every week since Triple H has taken over creative. Now, WWE may have retired the championship belt. We'll have to pay extra close attention in the coming weeks, but the 24-7 title may have been retired. On Monday Night Raw, Dana Brooks was noted as not wearing her belt. She was standing and staring awkwardly at a TV. Usually, she has it at her side at all times, or she has it on. She's always flaunting it. This has led to some speculation that the title may have been retired. Wrestlers in WWE yes. are getting their names back first. It was Austin Theory, who was promoted for a live event with his full name, and now it's Matt Riddle. So there are a ton of changes taking place in WWE right now. Tiring old weird gimmicky belts and dudes getting their names back. Now, a big name is being kicked around for a WWE return. Fightful Select is reporting that among the names pitched or discussed for a return to the company include that of former WWE Universal Champion Braun Strowman. Remember, Strowman was released by WWE on June 2nd of 2021, along with five other stars, just over a year after he had re-signed a seven-figure deal with the company back in 2019. Now, I don't know if this will happen. Strowman has had a lot of other things going on, and he started his own promotion with EC3 called Control Your Narrative. Speculation is that he will show up on Monday Night Raw this week, so tune in and let's find out. A big-time AEW star, no longer with the company. And this may have led to some of those changes that we've seen taking place on this AEW card. Fightful reported Wednesday night that Bobby Fish is no longer under contract with AEW after his deal expired and hadn't been renewed. On Wrestling Observer, Dave, confirmed, Dave Meltzer confirmed this by saying, it sounds early because he started in October, but I know you're right. It's probably not. He's done. It's confirmed. He's done. Whatever the deal was, either he was not offered a renewal or he chose not to renew. Going into this, uh, this upcoming week, Bobby Fish on... A lot of different media outlets was basically putting over Triple H as head of creative in WWE. I don't know if that led to a strain. I don't know if they just don't see the value with with Bobby Fish. Obviously, at this point, AEW has a very bloated roster. So don't be surprised if you start to see some names being let go or not offered renewals. But that's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. We've got a fantastic weekend of wrestling ahead. Absolutely. 60 minutes of glory. We just dropped it for you guys on this Saturday morning. Thank you. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Look forward to breaking it all down with you on the next episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. Podcasting time has now come to a close. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Message us anytime you want. Uncensored, unfiltered, dedicated to Detroit sports, and one of the top, top guys in podcasting. Thanks, cuz.